Brother Dusty is going to share today. And the next Sunday, I'll be preaching. I'm going to kick off the month of May. This is the last Sunday of April. So I'll be preaching next week. And then Sister Kim, the second week of May, which is Mother's Day. Sister Kim will be sharing. And then we'll give you more information after that. But you'll be praying for our services ahead. God has really been speaking to us. I'm thankful that our people have faith. They're receiving God's word. You are remaining connected to truth. And again, thank you, Dusty, for sharing. God bless you so much. And uh, I want you to take the liberty to tell what happened in your life this week with Sister Sierra. You tell about that. Thank you, Pastor. All of that. She's been working so hard for it. Tell them all about that. Uh, before I talk about what happened with Sierra, um, it's kind of funny. Every time I'm up here, it seems like God confirms yep. what I'm about to talk about. Um, <laughs> it's like uh, someone gave the worship team my notes before church started. So. Um, God is good. But this past Monday, um, Sierra graduated from college. Yeah. She's, uh, she's one step closer to becoming a respiratory therapist, so I couldn't yeah. be more proud of her. Um, which makes it even more appropriate what I'm about to talk about today, considering she's in the health field. Um, but I'm going to be speaking on uh, Jehovah Rapha. Which is the God who heals. Praise God. It can also be translated to Jehovah Rophi, which is also uh, the God who heals or the God who restores. Um, but before I begin, um, if you please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for already setting the stage for my message, Lord. Uh, you know what you want to say today. Uh, just help me to be obedient to you. Um, just lead me where you want me to go. Uh, touch everyone's hearts that they would be willing to receive. Give us understanding. Give us a deeper revelation of your word and what you're trying to speak to us and give to us today, Lord. Um, let it manifest in our lives that we, that we see the fruits of the word, that we see it spread throughout our households and our families, Lord, that... We wouldn't just be touched by it, but the ones that we come in contact would be touched by it, Lord. Uh, yeah. Just touch us today. Help us to be obedient. Give us ears to hear. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So like I said, I'm speaking on Jehovah Rapha. Um, it appears only once in Scripture. And it's the second name that Yahweh used to reveal himself to his people. Um, it arises out of one of Israel's earliest experiences in the wilderness after their exodus from Egypt. So if you'd like, um, please turn to Exodus 15, and we're going to be reading verses 22 through 27. Um, I'm reading out of the NIV. Um, it's the story of the waters of Merah and Elam. Uh, verse 22 says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went to the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Merah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Merah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you, Jehovah Rapha. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees, and they camped there near the water. So the Hebrew word rofi, or Rapha, and it can also be translated as Rofecha, or Rofecha, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, but it means to restore, to heal, or to make healthful. 
and it appears alone in reference to Yahweh. So the word Rofi appears other times in the Bible, but there's only one time that it is referred to as Jehovah Rapha or Jehovah Rofi. But the word Rofi or Rapha is used more than 60 times throughout the Old Testament. So 60 times God talks about healing, heal, to make whole, to make healthful. And I want you to remember that, that 60 times, and I'm sure there's more times throughout the New Testament that God speaks on healing, obviously because Jesus, majority of his ministry was spent healing. But I'll talk about that more later. But Jehovah Rapha is the one who heals and the one who restores. A lot of people focus, it seems like at least, doing research, when you try to look up Jehovah Rapha, most people focus on the one who heals. But I also want to talk about the one who restores. Because he not only heals you, he restores you back to your, your further uh, position. Your previous position, I should say. Restoration is defined as the process of restoring someone or something back to life. To put back into existence, to fit into an established pattern. In order for something to restore, to be restored, it must first be broken. It must have been broken in the first place if it needs restoration. Mm, yeah. Before we were saved from our sinful life, we needed God to restore us. Mm -hmm. We needed to be returned back to Him. He had to restore us to our original intended position. Mm -hmm. In Exodus 15, 20 through 27, which we just read, about God taking the bitter waters and making it sweet, making it drinkable, purifying it. How did he go about this? He did it in an, an extraordinary way, in an unordinary way, because most people wouldn't take a piece of wood and throw it in a lake to make it drinkable. That's not how we purify things today. That's not how the county pur purifies your water. They don't just throw wood in a tank and make it drinkable for you and your family. But God has the ability to take what is bitter in our lives and make yeah. it sweet. Yeah. He takes what is contaminated and purifies it. He yeah. restored the waters to its intended condition. In verse 25, it says, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. The wood, or sometimes it's translated as the tree, is symbolic of the cross that Jesus was crucified on. Through Jesus, God has taken us in our bitter souls, our bitter lifestyles, and transformed us into something new and sweet, and that is sweet and nice to Him. It's good for Him to look upon us now. Yeah. Psalm 23.3 says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He restoreth my soul. He makes us new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The yeah. old life is gone and a new yeah. life has begun. Yeah. 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 Romans 8, uh, verse uh, 1 through 4, I believe, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus, and because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Yeah. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could, could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. Who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the spirit. So we are made new through the cleansing of our spirits through Jesus Christ's blood on the cross. Galatians 3.13 But Christ has rescued us from the curse. Once again, he's speaking about the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, curses everyone who is hung on a tree. So once again, we see the word tree. It, it takes you back to verse uh, to Exodus 15, what he threw in the water, right. the tree. Right. Everything, like I said before, in the Word, in the Old Testament, if you look at it, points to Jesus right. in some way or another. Yeah. Yeah. The entire Bible is circulates him. It's all about him. He's the core. That's right. It's either pointing to him, yes. leading you to him, or speaking about him, proclaiming about him. Everything is about Jesus. But it says in Galatians, like we just read, 
He has rescued us from the curse. We no longer have to live under the curse. Because of the blood of Christ. We have been redeemed. We have been restored. We are now like Adam and Eve in the garden. We are restored through the blood of Christ. Isaiah 53, 5 uh, prophesied about Jesus. Isaiah said, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. What are we talking about today? Jehovah Rapha is God is our healer. Well, how are we healed? God sent Jesus and he was beaten and whipped so that we could be healed. He took our sins, our transgressions, but he also took our sickness upon himself. We are healed by his stripes. So we no longer have to oper operate under a sickness mentality, a sickness lifestyle. We don't have to stay in that area of disease anymore. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord. I do not change. That is why your descendants of, you descendants of Jacob are not already dead, uh, destroyed. He says, I am the Lord. I do not change. And then in Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. True. So if God was healing people then, yes. it says he's your healer to the Israelites in Exodus 15, then you yeah, can right. take it to the bank that he's your healer today yeah. because he said, I do not change. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Many people live under the impression that God makes them sick at times or that it's his will for them to be sick, to teach them some kind of lesson or even to punish them. And I know I've touched on this before, but I want to go back to this because I feel like we may not operate. I don't know how you believe or how you were raised, but many people were raised in the church to believe this type of mentality, to believe this doctrine yeah. that if you are sick, it's some kind of sin that you or your parents or it's a generational curse that passed down. Right. I believe there are generational curses, but we don't have to live with that generational curse. Yeah. We don't have to operate. It says we are set free from the curse. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to live in that sickness. You don't have to Amen. stay there. Amen. Many, uh, oh, but God said he was the same and he never changes. Right. So if he is our healer and Jesus died to make us new, to make us whole, then he died to restore our mind, our body, and our soul. That's, yes. it. That's, it. That's it. Like I said, if he healed the Israelites then, then he is our healer today. Yes. If he can heal my cousin Joey... Yes. And he can do it for my family. He can do it for your family. Glory he can do it for God. you. Glory to God. He says he's not a respecter of persons. If he'll do it for one, he'll do it for all. Yeah. Hallelujah. John 14, 6 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. What did he say? Then? He said, I am the life. Jesus is the life. He's the giver of life. Because yes. it says that all creation was made by the word, through the word. Yes. So if he is life, he's the essence of life. He's the giver of life. Yes. He is the word that created yes. all of creation. Yes. The Holy Spirit is the advocator of life. Yes. Yes. If God breathed his life into us yes. at the beginning of time, yes. we call him the great physician. He calls himself Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Then how can we also believe that he is the giver of sickness and disease and affliction and a God of death? If you believe that God wants you to be sick or makes you sick to glorify himself in some way, then you would also have to believe that God is lying to you when he declares that he is the God of life, that Jesus is life. You cannot be death and life. God is not a liar. He's not... Uh, double-minded. He doesn't say one thing out of one side of his mouth and one right. thing out of the other. That's right. That's right. Amen. If he says he's the giver of life, he's the great physician, that he will heal you, that he wants you well, yeah. then you cannot believe that he is also making you sick at the same time. It doesn't work that way. Right. He's not going to work against himself. True. Because in Matthew 22 through 30, or 12, 22 through 30, he doesn't speak about healing or sickness here but Jesus talks to the Pharisees when they accuse him of working with demons to cast out demons from demons as people mm -hmm. it says then a demon possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus he healed the man so that he could both speak and see then the crowd was amazed and said 
Could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, No wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and replied, Any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you have said. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. And we'll go back to that, because I want to talk about the kingdom of God. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Who is more powerful than God? How could God be fighting against himself? Only someone even stronger is someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So just as Jesus said, how, how could he be making you sick and healing you at the same time? Why would he put demons on you to cast them out? It makes no sense. What would he be accomplishing? If you think that God's sitting there harming you in some way to glorify himself, then he's no more than a little puppet master. He's sitting up there pulling the strings. And what kind of evil? That's not a good God. You see, doctors or medical professionals have been, there's been certain medical professionals who in the past have taken medicine or do, done certain things to make people sick on purpose so that they can come back and make it look like they're the ones that made them better so that they get the glory and they, it's a pride thing and they lift themselves up or it furthers their career. Now that, that is illegal in America. You'll go to jail. That's frowned upon. That's immoral, right? right. That's a horrible thing to do, right. to put th someone through pain to glorify yourself. Right. So if we as Americans, as finite, we have finite understanding of morality of anything compared to God, who is his understanding of the universe and how things work. He's the giver of morality and all that is good. If we think it's wrong... To, put, to make someone sick or harm someone to glorify ourselves as doctors or medical professionals or nurses or whatever, then why would we think that God is making people sick to make himself look better? Right. Right. When he, if he is a good God, if he is the giver of morality or ethics, then we think it's wrong for people to do that. Why would we think it's acceptable for God to act, to act that way? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up with the rest of the word, all the other things that he's told us. Jesus said that why would he make he put demons on people to fight against them? A house that is divided cannot stand. Why would God make you sick just to heal you? That doesn't sound like the God I know. That's not the God who does who gives you blessings and says that he turns everything for the goodness of those who love him. If we are his children, we love God. And we operate under his commandments. We are we have accepted Jesus into our lives. And we live by the way that Jesus tells us to live. And we are his children. Yes. So he said that all things are, he makes good for those that love, for us that love him. Yeah. Sickness doesn't really fall into goodness to me. I don't feel good being filled with disease or being oppressed by Satan or anything like that. God never claims to be the God of death. God says he's the giver of life. Yeah, that's right. He always heals. He always restores. He always improves upon. Because if you go back to Exodus 15, what happened after they purif he purified the water? Right. Right. He took them to another place that had 70 palms. And it was beautiful. And it was filled with water that they could drink. So he shows you how he can improve on what is bad, the negative. And then he blesses you with even more than you had before. He's always yeah. taking you a step further. Yeah. Everything comes back to Jesus, like I talked about before. So if you look at John 14, verses 6 through 14, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, then you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do not know him, or you do know him and have seen him. So if you know Jesus, you know the Father. So if Jesus didn't operate, operate that way, why would we believe that God the Father operates that way? Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. 
The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. Yeah. So God was doing His work through Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Believe me when I say, I am in the Father and the Father is me. At least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Yeah. So the miracles and the works that Jesus was doing was evidence to the nature of who God was. So once again, why would Jesus go around healing people, casting out demons, if God wanted those people sick? Amen. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that my Father may be glorified in the Son, and you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So we ask God to heal us. Jesus even called us to lay hands on people, to pray yes. for the sick. Right. Praise God. Yeah. All of this does not point to a God who wants you living in sickness and disease and Amen. condemnation and anxiety, Amen. depression, fear, yeah. mental sickness. All of these things do not point to God. Amen. If you want to know who God was, then look at what Jesus did. Besides teaching, Jesus spent most of his time in his ministry casting out demons and healing people. That was what he spent the majority of his time doing while he was on this earth. And if you look at the New Testament, you'll find approximately 26 different times that he healed people. Jesus never suggested that people's afflictions were part of God's will. He was on the side of healing, not afflicting. Acts 10, 37 through 38 says, You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed yes. by the devil, for God was with yes. him. So who was oppressing the people? Mm -hmm. Since they were oppressed by the devil. By the devil. Yeah. Another translation says all who were harassed by the yeah. devil. Yeah. So when looking at sickness, disease, or the evil in the world, we have to understand that there is a corrupting force that is in the world and even in nature that comes against God. John 10.10 10 says, The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Glory. Three times Jesus refers to Satan as the archon of this world. In John 12.31, John 12.14.30, and John 16.11. The Greek word archon refers to the highest ruling authority in a given region, and it can even be translated to Lord, Prince, or Ruler. So Jesus said that Satan was the ruler of this earth. Three times. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is called the God of this age. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. Mm -hmm. The commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Not to say that God isn't still sovereign in the world. When the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world, it's not saying that he has ultimate authority or power. He's more powerful than God. I'm not saying that. It's conveying that he rules over the unbelieving in the world. And that's the key. Is the, he is the God of the unbelievers. He's the God of anyone who's outside of the kingdom, who's outside of Jesus. 1 John 5.19 We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. So the world around us, around the church, around his people, are ruled by Satan. He is also called the destroyer, the one who deceives the nations. That is his whole purpose, to destroy, to kill, to take away from God, to take away from God's people. Yes, yes. Ephesians 6.12, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against yeah. evil spirits in the heavenly places. So God didn't create the world to be in this state. But even nature is in rebellion against God. Originally, death was not part of God's design. Hebrews 2.14 says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. So Jesus broke the power of Satan. So we don't have to live in fear. I'm not telling you all this. So you live in fear that Satan has power over the world. He's in control. He's power over your life. That's not what I'm saying. Because they said that Jesus came to break that power. Yeah. 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 Jesus came to break the power that Satan had over us, over this world. And he took back 
the keys of death, hell, and the grave. God didn't create evil, though. You have to understand, He didn't create sickness. He didn't create being, or he, but He did create beings with free will. And having free will allows the possibility of evil, but it doesn't create the actuality of evil. What creates evil is when we choose sin, and then the actions of free agents as ourselves, or even demonic spirits or angelic forces, is what brings evil into existence. In Colossians 2.15, though, it says that Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities through the cross. So we don't have to live in fear. But you have to stop believing the lies of Satan. God is not a God who sits in the sky watching us suffer in silence. He's not a mean old man up in the world watching us being tortured and tormented for his own pleasure and satisfaction. He is a God who said he's right by our side. As Brandon spoke on, he, he said he sees. He sees us. He's our comforter. He's our healer. He's with us at all times. And if you go back to where we first started in Exodus 15, verse 25 says that first Moses cried out to the Lord. All he did was cry out to God. And immediately, God gave him the solution. So all you have to do is cry out to him. He's already aware of your situation. He's just waiting for you to come to him. He's already there. Jesus is already willing. And he is able to heal you. He said he is for us, not against us. He said he would ne never leave us or forsake us. But be with us always, always, no matter what. No matter what you've done. No matter where you've been. He said he will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. There is no escape from his love. He said he's a God of life and life more abundant. He is Jehovah Rapha, our healer, our restoration, our redeemer. If you trust in him, then you, have, you can believe that he has the power to take any circumstance in your life, any bitter situation, and he will make it sweet. He will make it better than before. So any sickness or disease in your life, he can restore life back to you. We don't have to operate under disease or sickness. We don't have to accept it because we are not children of Satan or the enemy. We are not children of this world. We are children of Jesus Christ and we have been set free from these things. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 